We've got our guest tonight, so even better. All right, let's jump into it. Uh, you know, my name is Dominic Torres. Uh, excited to be here. We have a few guests and a few more members online. And it looks like at some point, some other members are going to show up too. We're having a discussion about moving this completely online. And that way it's easier for everyone to be able to show up. All right, so with that said, let's jump into our flag soon. Boom, boom, boom. What over there? <laughs> right in Franklin's face. <laughs> right, right there, right I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. All right, all right. With that said, let's just go with introductions. Raymond is on the ones and twos. There he is. Um, here. Real quick, give me like 10 seconds on who you are. Come on up here. Excited to have you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I was invited here today by Raymond. Uh, I am the owner of LA Trash Junkers. I do junk removal on property cleanouts. So I'm just happy to see if uh, how I can contribute to this great cause. And you're a Marine. <laughs> and I'm also a Marine, too. Another jar. Come over and say hi. I'm... Say your name. It doesn't matter. Come on over, Franklin. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Frank Gondek. I'm just a regular here at Dom's Spot at uh, High Point. And I wanted to check out the regular meetings and show out. See you yeah. on Radical. Well, I'm glad to have you. All right, everyone knows me. I'm Dominic Torres. I'm chair of this. And let's get to it. All right, working on my phone. We got a guest speaker tonight, which is nice because, you know, they don't necessarily always show up. Uh, tonight we have Jeffrey W. Is it Rocker? How do I say that? Uh, Raker. Raker. Yeah. <laughs> got it. Oh, the Missing Marines Project. Uh, I don't like to read your bios out loud because I feel like you're going to give me a whole thing right now. So all I'm going <laughs> to say is this, that the Missing Marines Project advocates for the recovery of missing servicemen by commemorating their lives and supporting their repatriation efforts. And with that said, sir, go right ahead and take it. All righty. I'm going to pop up a screen share. So let me know if you all can see it okay. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. There you go. Hmm. It's a name it. Right. No, right. Right here. All right, go right ahead. There it All is. Right. Oh. Okay, we can see. We're good. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Um yeah, so thank you all uh, for for having me here, uh, especially to uh Raymond Foster for uh pitching the idea in the first place and reaching out. Um uh I founded uh this project in uh 2011. Um, and since then have been uh, fortunate enough to participate in a couple of uh, successful recoveries. Um, primarily what I do is I support uh, organizations, both governmental and nonprofit, uh, doing research and um, case building support uh, rather than going out in the field and doing any forensics. Um, so what I'm going to do today to focus our little presentation, I'll take you through a case study um of one of our uh, one of our projects that's dearest and closest to me um just to give you an idea of uh, sort of what the process is and uh, give you an idea of what sort of what the resources are out there if you're interested in uh, pursuing research into a missing individual so we'll start off with a couple of numbers um in world war ii the united states marine corps suffered 24,511 fatal casualties of that number, 2,600 are considered missing or non-recovered, which is about 11%. So I figure you, if you went overseas and you were killed, you had a one in 10 chance uh, that your family would never have your body returned. Um, my project's a bit different. I track um, almost 3,000 cases. I include uh, Navy corpsmen uh, and uh, losses that took place in the continental United States, which are not generally tracked by the DPAA. <clears throat> Our case for today uh, is Sergeant Arthur Irvin. Uh, he served with Company A, 1st Battalion, 24th Marines. He was born in McCurtain, Oklahoma in 1922. Uh, he was in a uh, very right, blue collar family. His father was a coal miner uh, who was killed in an explosion when Arthur was only a few months old. Um, so he was technically a junior, but he grew up never knowing his father. Um, 
he had a his mother married remarried several times so he had a bunch of half siblings and step siblings uh, as well as you know two older brothers he grew up in Lafleur County Oklahoma and Red River County Texas um between 34 and 39 he moved to Los Angeles attended high school uh worked as a worked in a newspaper room uh, and lived with an older brother um his stepfather passed away in 1940 he came back to uh Detroit Texas to help support his mother joined the Marine Corps at the age of 18 in June of 1940. And here he is a few days after enlisting, uh, a little 18 years old. Uh, he attended recruit training at MCRD San Diego. Um, from there, he was assigned to the Naval Air Station Pearl Harbor, where he got into a little bit of trouble uh, with a buddy of his, and it culminated in um, them breaking into a bar, stealing some money, and borrowing a civilian's car. Um, for this, they were thrown in the brig and they happened to be there during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, he was let out, um, volunteered to go man the defensive positions and then uh, to help dig uh, ordnance out of the field afterwards. Um, but this wasn't enough to put him back in the good graces of his commanding officer and he was sent directly back to the brig and then sent to Mare Island Naval Prison in January 1942, uh, anticipating a lengthy prison sentence and a bad conduct discharge. However, uh, they soon realized that they were going to need all of the men that they could get, especially ones with a few years of experience under their belt. So Irvin and his buddy Jim Coop, who's the gentleman on the left in these two pictures, were released. They were sent um, to the 22nd Marines, which were stationed in Samoa. Uh, from there, they, uh, they got bored of duty in Samoa, and they volunteered to join the 3rd Raider Battalion, uh, which was forming there in September of 1942. Uh, they participated uh, in the invasions of the Russell Islands. Uh, it was known as Operation Clean Slate. It was a blood, um, bloodless uh, invasion, um, but one that got to show off some of their radar capabilities. Um, during that time, uh, Arthur wound up contracting filariasis and malaria um, and was sent out from the raiders back to California uh, to recover. Um, I include the picture on the right if there are any... Um, Civil War history buffs in the audience, you might recognize the name of Ed Bars, uh, who was a former um, National Parks tour guide and well-known um, historian. He was uh, he served in the same squad as uh, James and Arthur. <clears throat> From California, uh, he wound up in Company A, the Twenty Fourth Marines, which was just had just recently been formed in California. He was made a machine gun squad leader. Uh, he went overseas for his first operation, the Battle of Roynda Moor, Operation Flintlock, in early February 1944. Was wounded shortly after landing, uh, but continued uh, continued to fight on. He took out an entire bunker basically on his own. For this, he was cited for the Navy, was cited for and received uh, the Navy Cross. When he gets back from the hospital, he becomes a section sergeant of mortars and serving with First Lieutenant Philip Emerson Wood Jr., uh, who happens to be a relative of mine, which is how I got interested in Irvin's case in the first place. Um, trains with the mortars, they debar they um, take part in the Battle of Saipan, Operation Forager, uh, which starts on the 15th of June, 1944. Um, don't have very much information on what Irvin did during the battle, but I do know that um, he was cited for leading a patrol that um, eliminated a very troublesome Japanese strong point without any casualties to, to his patrol. And he was recommended for this, a second award of a Silver Star. So the section fights on until D plus 20, which is July 5th, 1944. Um, these are some pictures uh, from the National Archives that are actually depict the, the event in question. Um, we have a quote from their commanding officer. Uh, basically, their company was preparing to advance. The mortars were firing. A group of civilians came out of some caves um, seeking some shelter. Uh, Lieutenant Wood and Sergeant Irvin took a volunteer patrol forward to bring them back, uh, many of whom, uh, many of them were wounded. They said, you know, they, the Japanese still have the men in the caves. The patrol volunteered to return, and they, knowing that there were enemy forces in the area and they were ambushed, um, Lieutenant Wood was shot first. Sergeant Irvin um, apparently ran out in order to, to rescue him. Uh, and was killed uh, side by side. And I have a uh, few veterans have told me that his, the last words they heard him say were, don't worry, Phil, I'm coming for you. Um, so you can imagine as, as a relative of Lieutenant Woods, how that, that uh, it's 
quite powerful to hear. Um, but the important part I want to get into here is that we have, you know, Sergeant Irvin died alongside of him, as did First Sergeant Richardson. The captain says here, I visited Phil's, Phil's grave several times. He's buried in the Fourth Marine Cemetery on Saipan. Next to him lie his buddies, Sergeant Irvin, First Sergeant Richardson, and Private First Class Knight. This is going to be important coming up because um, here are a couple of other pictures of the patrol. And uh, I did find from another veteran that although the patrol did suffer many casualties, they were able to save about 60 uh, civilians, uh, mostly uh, Chamorros, uh, or the, the indigenous population of Saipan. Um, so and this veteran said that even though one of his friends was killed in this patrol, he thought it was worth the risk. So uh, we know what happened to Arthur Irvin, um, but for some reason, uh, out of everybody who died on that patrol, his remains were classed as non recovered In order to solve this mystery, um, we start looking at some of the primary sources that are available. Um, these are usually uh, available through uh, the National Archive System, uh, the Marine Corps History Division at Quantico. Um, I'm going to I do focus mostly on Marine cases. Uh, Army cases would follow a slightly different protocol just because of the uh, the kind of records that are available. Uh, if you have any questions about that, I'll be happy to uh, to answer them, or you can always contact me and I'll put you in touch with, with somebody who knows. Um, the big ones to look for, muster rules, casualty cards, the official military personnel file, or the individual deceased personnel file, and what's called an X file. So, must rules are first. Um, if you have an ancestry membership, you could get these online pretty easily. A lot of them have been digitized. Um, these are extreme, usually extremely accurate uh, in terms of who was where at what time because they are used for calculating pay. And the Marine Corps is very concerned, you know, with keep maintaining maintaining budgets at all time. They can have mistakes from time to time, but generally this is a very good, accurate first source. Um, you can look in here, you will get you know, your individual's name, their service number, military occupational specialty, which in the 1940s was a three digit code. I know today it's, it's four. Um, and it shows you any changes that took place during the month. In the event of you know, somebody is dead or wounded, uh, the cause and their disposition is noted. So you see here the arrow indicating Sergeant Arthur Irvin um, participated in Battle of Saipan, 5th, died of wounds, uh, character excellent, remains unknown. Once you have this information, you can request a casualty card. Um, these are on file with the Marine Corps History Division at Quantico. Um, this will give you a more uh, detailed synopsis of the you know, disposition of um, the, the disposition of remains or you know whatever injuries wounds or other traumas they may have suffered it takes information from a bunch of different sources so you'll occasionally see conflicting information on these cards um and you can see there's a lot of a lot of things have been crossed out here and there's a lot of updates and underlines and different typefaces and everything um so this is kind of a this is kind of a capsule history of um of somebody being wounded every single casualty or injury uh, suffered in the Marine Corps um, has one of these cards. It, it could be a it could be a broken toe, or it could be somebody who was killed in action. Um, if you need to find the specifics on some, how somebody was hurt, they will have it here. Um, as I note here, they are occasionally contradictory, but they are a good way to kind of verify information used from other sources. To get really stuck into things, you want to get the official military personnel file. This includes service record book and any pieces of paperwork that would have attended the individual throughout their time in the service. Um, the re really great wealth of information. Um, this is sort of where we learned all about uh, Irvin's you know, adventure as, a, as an automobile thief and all that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> these are really important uh, because they give you the individual's physical characteristics and fingerprints. Um, this was most useful, obviously, during the war when uh, people, when fingerprints could be taken. If you had a deceased individual, if you weren't sure of their identity, you could take their fingerprints and they would be sent along with the record books of anyone who was missing from a particular place uh, for you know, professional you know, fingerprint analysis. And they did manage to account for a lot of casualties quite quickly that way. Um, they would have you know, experts from the, from, the, uh, from the FBI doing the fingerprint comparisons. Um, of course, you know, after a couple of years, uh, you're not going to be able to take fingerprints, so this be, kind of becomes useless. You can also get from here um, the medical history of the person. Um, most of what you want to get from here is dental records, and we'll get into that in a little bit too. Um, it is 
difficult to get that released by NARA if you're not a member, a direct member of the family um, or a veteran or the veteran themselves. Um, they they keep that they keep that information kind of private and they redact it when they send you the records. So fortunately, you can get it usually in this other file, which is called the individual deceased personnel file. This is an abbreviated file. This is focused really on um, what happens, you know, after the individual was killed and um, any search efforts that were made for their remains. Um, anybody who was missing, um, as you can see up here on the upper right, uh, it talks about how you know them trying to search for Sergeant Irvin basically could find nothing. Um, but yeah, the important thing to grab out of here is this dental record. So it gives you, again, the physical description, and this shows you what Sergeant Arvin's teeth looked like at the time of his induction, and it's supposed to be updated every time he has dental work done. Uh, this became the big thing um, that was the big point of comparison uh, for forensic work after the war, because um, that was, at the time, kind of the limits of forensic technology, um, dental comparison and physical characteristics. And then there's a separate kind of file called an X file. These ones are generated for remains that have been recovered, but are considered unidentifiable. Um, it will tell you where they were found. It gives you an anthropological discussion of uh, of the remains, um, very detailed um, list of bones. This is a, 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 a fatality who was, brought, was uh, recovered from uh, Tarawa um, in 1946, I think. So this person is still uh, still unidentified and is, um, I think, buried in. They're they're buried, either buried in Honolulu or they may have been exhumed for uh, for examination. I'm not quite sure of the status of this this specific individual. But this is kind of the, this is as much this is as far as forensic science could take you uh, in the late 1940s. <clears throat> so, kind of to understand how uh, someone can wind up being uh, unidentified if you can recover a body. Um, the general manual at the time back then was called the Technical Manual 10360 or Graves Registration. At the time of burial, you're supposed to put one tag on a body, one tag on a marker if the tags are present. Uh, you attempt to identify the person through any personal effects, marks on clothing, anything that you can find around that might give you some sort of clues. Take fingerprints if you can. Um, and there was a specific form, which you can see up here on the upper right, uh, Graves Registration Form Number 1, Report of Interment, uh, which is supposed to include all of this um, pertinent information. It will be sealed up in a bottle and be buried with the remains, with the idea that the team coming to exhume those remains later uh, would then have you know, a, as much information as possible to help uh, identify the person there. Um, this is what burial on Saipan looked like. Not a pretty picture, I know, but you can sort of see not a lot of not a lot of niceties. It's basically we need to get these guys underground as quickly as possible. So you can there's a lot of room for error and a lot of room for um, things getting lost, misplaced, and in a case like this, it's very even the simplest mistake can completely throw off uh, an identification. Um, I'm going to hover on personal effects a little bit because. This is particularly interesting, I think, in Irvin's case. Um, <clears throat> when they start to inventory the personal effects, anything that's government property, damaged, might be potentially distressing for loved ones or objectionable, um, that would reflect poorly on the character of this use would be taken out um, before shipment. Um, they would generally do two inventories. Uh, the first one was, was items carried on a person's body and items that were stored back in their in camp. Um, this was not always explained to the families. Um, so you would have people saying, well, how come you're finding all of his clothing? You can't find his, you can't find his body at all. And they say, well, this is what was kept in his barracks bags or in his footlocker back at camp. Um, so this, uh, I believe, is um, the box that was, this is this is Sergeant Irvin's belongings that he had back at Camp Maui uh, or in a sea bag uh, rather than what he was carrying on him at the time. So his wife, uh, whose name was Odina, she received two separate packets of stuff. This is, oh, there she is. First one was this from his, um, from his barracks bag. And then later, she got a second one in 1945 with cigarette case, a bunch of souvenirs. Um, 
field scarves and neckties for Marines, um, a couple of other items, a bag of assorted gear and a wristwatch. So the question is, well, how, could, how did she get two, um, two bundles of belongings? This is Odina. Um, this is a picture that was taken for the uh, Los Angeles Times. Um, so we've got our picture of Arthur over there. Uh, and you can see she's got his purple heart. She's got his, you know, his Japanese flag. And there's a little close up of some of the some of the things she has in her box there. She's got his uh, his shooting decorations. She's got some patches. She's got some ribbons. You know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so as you can imagine, for what a very you know great you know, nice to be able to have these bits and pieces. What makes this particularly interesting, and when you start digging into uh, family history like this, you start to uh, uncover all sorts of little um, mysteries and secrets. This article was written um, in a newspaper uh, printed for the CBs. And it's important to note here, what prompted Marine Sergeant Irvin to wrap his identification tags, letters, and other personal articles in a Japanese flag before he was killed on Saipan probably will never be known. These items were all found stuffed into a package of mortar shells tossed in a garbage dump uh, on Saipan. This is everything that would have been needed to identify Sergeant Irvin at the time of his burial. ID tags, letters, personal effects, everything, which for some reason was taken from his body before burial, boxed up, clearly hidden, and thrown in a trash pile when it was found completely by chance. So those things were taken. They were sent back to his widow. Here she is. So what makes this even more interesting is that Odina remarried pretty quickly after the war to this guy. His name was Kenneth Gann. It was formerly uh, Corporal Kenneth Gann, and Corporal Kenneth Gann served in the same company as Sergeant Irvin. The two of them famously did not get along, and there was some suspicion in within the company that there was something going on between uh, the, the three of them. Um, this was sort of proven out a little bit later after the war because Odina and Kenneth tried to sue Sergeant Irvin's family uh, for his health insurance policy. Um, there was some confusion as to who the correct beneficiary was. Um, he had switched it a couple of times. He intended to switch it back to his mother, but the paperwork got lost. And eventually it began to this court case, which you can look up and read the entire thing. Um, they did wind up finding uh, the case for, for his mother. Um, so she did manage to get it. Um, this is a letter that he wrote uh, for the, for the court, it was submitted as evidence into the court case. Um, so, <clears throat> knowing what we know about Sergeant Irvin, we've got his known physical characteristics from the sergeant from the service record book. We know where his we know his unit, A124. We can trace where that unit was um, up to the date and the location of his death on 5th July 1944 in Saipan. Um, we know the cause of the death. He was on patrol. He was shot. Veteran sources say he was shot in the head. Um, so he would look for that kind of trauma. We know that he served with First Lieutenant Philip Wood and with another number of other individuals who are named killed at the same time. According to a condolence letter, he is possibly buried in the 4th Marine Division Cemetery on Saipan. Condolence letters are not always um, accurate because their main, I mean, their their main purpose is to you know, console somebody. Um, not to necessarily report the accurate facts, um, but it can be a it can be a good source of information too. <clears throat> so knowing what we know, we can start picking up on a few more advanced clues. This is a section of the burial chart for the Fourth Marine Division Cemetery on Sa on Saipan. We have this quote from Captain Schechter. He was buried in the 4th Marine Division Cemetery on Saipan. Next to him lie his buddy Sergeant Irvin, First Sergeant Richardson, and Private First Class Knight. In row four here, we have got Richardson, somebody X-64, who's an unknown, Lieutenant Wood, Private First Class Cruz, and Private First Class Knight. Richardson, Wood, Cruz, and Knight are all members of the same unit who died on the same patrol on the same day. You can perhaps see where we're going. This X-64 is a, based on the circumstantial evidence that we have, is a pretty solid guess that this might be Sergeant Urban. So you take the X-File, 
for 64. It's unfortunately, this one is quite a sparse. Um, it depended on the unit that was doing the uh, doing the record keeping. Um, the report of inf the report of interment has very little information. Um, anthropology was described as a five foot four individual with light brown hair. Um, you can see that they've done a, a <clears throat> diagram of the body uh, where he's got what looks like could be potential uh, trauma to the skull, which may be consistent with a bullet wound, but we can't tell because it's it's just a sketch. Um, but this one includes two different dental charts, which is nice because we can take our dental chart from Irvin's service record and start comparing it over here. And it's not an exact one-to-one -one match. If it had been, this this would have been solved a while ago, but there is there are a lot of very strong, strong, strong similarities uh, between these two. Definitely enough at this point uh, to argue um, that this could be the same individual. So, we can argue X64 is a likely match of Irvin, uh, it's likely match because of the circumstantial evidence and the dental chart. These days, this would not be considered sufficient for a final identification. If they exhume remains, they will do, they may do chest rate, uh, chest x-rays. Um, when Marines went into the service, they they took x-rays to uh, as a part of a tuberculosis test. Um, so you can check um, surviving clavicles um, for comparison. Um, but the big one is mitochondrial DNA. It needs to be matched from a relative descendant on the mother's side. This is kind of the, this is still considered to be kind of the gold standard of um, of identification. And really it's the only thing that D the DPAA will accept, um, which sounds great, but finding a living relative can be a challenge. And find even if you do manage to find one, uh, finding one who's willing to send a DNA sample um, into the government, especially if this is not something that they have ever heard of before, um it can be it can be difficult uh, to kind of explain all of the all of the background work that goes into this and then you call somebody up and say hey are you related to so and so and they say well yeah but why do you know so much about my ancestors that's weird please don't contact me so you have to kind of approach it very diplomatically so <clears throat> finally i'd given this presentation before and uh this slide used to say uh we're still waiting but as of last June, um, just about a year ago, the uh, DPA finally announced that Sergeant Urban had been accounted for. They had exhumed X64 in 2018. Uh, he was... Put in placed in storage. Um, things were slow. We found a matching relative and sent the thing, sent in the um, sent in the DNA, and it was an immediate immediate match. So they had him flagged and they had him identified, and he's going to be buried this October uh, in the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, um, alongside uh, alongside his buddies. That's where Lieutenant Wood is buried and a few of his other friends from his unit. Um, so it's very much like he'll be coming back home to where he belongs. So it was, uh, I started looking for him in 2011 when I started this site. So this was about 11 years of, uh, of effort and arguing and uh, meeting a lot of, a lot of people. Um, but it was all, I think it was all worth it in the end. So we managed to get this done. So uh, we got Irvin solved, but there are still, you know, thousands more out there uh, and uh, search kind of continues. So there you go. Oh, for that. Well, thank you very much. Let's start there. Uh, uh, you know, as we get caught back up, uh, what a job well done, but it's also fantastic to know that the story ended well. I do not understand that there is thousands more still to go, but mm -hmm. I mean, 2011, at least you've got, you're starting to pick up Marines and whatnot, and other corpsmen. Um, I'm not sure uh, in this uh, this particular portion. We usually like to ask some questions, bug you a little bit, get a little bit farther in. But um, how many um, how many people have overall been recovered? I guess at this point, uh, been able to come back and be identified. I'm sorry, could you, uh, you, you? How many people are being like identified now? Like how? Like what is the success rate at this moment? 
I don't know if you can hear me. Um, it's a good question. Um, uh, overall, you can go to um, uh, dpaa.mil um, has got their kind of their current um, investigations in progress. Uh, it seems they and they they're not just working on Marines. They're not just working in World War II. They do are doing all branches. Um, they recently had an identification of a B-17 crew. Um, there's a lot coming in from Korea. They're about to start a, a massive project um, working on uh, remains recovered from a, uh, a hell ship, uh, the Enora Maru, uh, which was, you know, which was bombed in early 1945. Um, the success rate is, I believe, pretty good these days. Um, it's mostly uh, trying to find um find correct samples uh that are appropriate for dna matching um because without that they they aren't they aren't able to make a definitive um statement or a definitive identification um because I, I couldn't give you a number but the um the uh the progress rate has increased quite a bit uh over the past decade when i first started um there was the organization was called uh jpac uh joint pw ma accounting command um and they were kind of famously dysfunctional, and they would account for maybe three or four per year. Um, and now, the uh, we're getting you know, may up you know upwards of you know hundred hundred and more uh, each year. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, no, my time in service. Uh, I was actually just talking about him. Don't name uh, Corporal Vitia, and uh, they had sent him to Vietnam. Uh, mm -hmm. This I, I served between 03 and 0, uh, 07, and, and they had sent him to, uh, to Vietnam to go and uh, they were they were out doing exactly the same project to identify Marines and mm -hmm. folks that were there. So the fact that it's become that much more successful is fantastic to hear. Um, I know Brandon usually has a question also. He's got two questions. Mm -hmm. I already hit you with a bunch, and I feel like I said <laughs> them all at one time, but I just love it. Right at it. Sure. Uh, how do you work with the DPAA, Jeffrey? Um, number one. And number two is you mentioned ancestry.com. How much do you use that in your yes, work? Sir. Sure. Um, so I am in, I don't, I'm not an official representative of the DPAA. So I should disclaimer this for the recording. All opinions are strictly my own, et cetera. I don't represent them in any way. Um, I work, <laughs> yeah, I, I do, but I do, um, I do provide support for them. Um, when needed, I have a couple of guys there that I know a couple of a uh, couple of contacts there. Um, if I find a particular clue in one of my research things, I can reach out to them. Um, or if they have a question, they will sometimes come to me. Um, I do a lot of work much more directly. There's a nonprofit group called History Flight, which is based out of Florida. Um, you can definitely check them out. They've been doing a ton of work in the, uh, especially in the South Pacific. Pacific excuse me, the South Pacific uh, and Tarawa. Uh, they found two mass graves on that island, including um, the remains of Medal of Honor winner, uh, Lieutenant Alexander Bonnyman in 2015. Um, and they are responsible for bringing home you know, scores of uh, individuals. Um, so I have a, a pretty close working relationship with them um, and a couple of other nonprofits out there. There's a, there's a surprising number uh, of us out here in this in this field, kind of doing this independent research and then making it available. Um, and Ancestry, I, that's probably one of the best, uh, best subscriptions I've ever got. Um, highly recommend it for, uh, anyone interested in this line of work or just genealogy in general. I'm, I do use it daily. Um, it has its, uh, associated sites, newspapers.com and Fold3. Uh, Fold3 has got, you know, scanned military records and, and newspapers is, you know, it's just that it's, you know, period newspapers that are all searchable. Um, so you wind up taking all of these sites together, uh, and it's really, really fantastic resource. And just thinking back to when I started and how, uh, how little information was publicly available back then, um, it's really, it's really amazing um, now how much more you can do even just from your own home office. Um, you know, I don't have, I'll go to the archives whenever I can, or I'll have somebody go for me and look up something specific. But you can really make a lot of progress um, just using um just using resources that are uh, available to uh, the general public that's fantastic uh i'll say that anyone else have questions all right looks over fantastic you know what sir we appreciate your time if you'd like to stay on with us we'll have the rest of our, uh, the rest of our minutes but i appreciate everything you've done uh what a phenomenal 
overall organization that this is mm -hmm. to make sure that all our uh, boys come home and are identified and then with their their brothers that can actually lie peacefully. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's that's the problem. That's the promise we made to them uh, when they went, and it's a promise we have to we we got to keep. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All righty. Thank you all. Yeah. Okay. All right. With that said, let's go. Uh, food drive, 29 palms. That's what we're looking at now. Uh, September 30th. So we're discussing, excited about it. Um, then we have our USMC benefit dinner. I'm still, that's what's going to be the 11th this year? 10th. 10th. It's actually on the 10th this year. Is it always on the 10th? I, can't I know when the Marine Corps birthday is. I can't remember when you're doing it. Oh, no, that's not about me. I assume you guys are. Yeah. It actually is going to be the solid tense. Yeah. That would be. All right, cool. That's wonderful. The problem is that this brewery is also founded on the 10th. So I, you know, have to kind of be here during times like that. So I just want to make sure I understood. Then with that said, we're doing the kick out slash installation on June 22nd from 6 first. June 21st, 6 to 8.30 at Zendejas Mexican Restaurant. Everyone make sure you come strapped. Joint club assembly to kick out the old president and install the new president and officers. And you must register for this dinner ahead of time. Uh, uh, please indicate a spouse, last guest, and dinner will be provided. Be wary. They even spent a lot of time with the sheriffs there. I've been hanging out. So I just know that from the city. Watch out. <laughs> then July 5th is our speaker is Lieutenant Colonel I would love to say that last name Ted, what do you think Raymond? Oh no You had a hell of a better grip of this language than I do But B-U Someone say it B-U-C-I-E-R-K-A Busuka? Busuka? Alright, well that gentleman's going to come on and he's retired he's the Marine Raider Foundation Provides a benevolent support to active duty, the American retired Marsoc Raiders and their families, as well as the families of the Raiders who have lost their lives to service to our nation. We're trying to get a head count for this meeting. He just wants to come in person, which would be fantastic. Uh, the Marine Corps has more recently in, uh, reinstalled the, uh, the Raiders inside the Marine Corps. That's in the last several years. So that's a little bit more fun. All right. And then jumping to our calendar, which was up there, but it's fine. It's right here, too, so it doesn't matter. Uh, Wednesday, June 14th, 2023, 12 to 1, we have our SDRC board meeting. All members are welcome to come to it. Uh, Wednesday, June 21st, at 6 to 8.30, that is the Zenday Haas, which we'd like to get a, a head count on. Um, uh, Thursday, June 29th, is 6 to 7, is the USMC benefit dinner meeting, meeting via Zoom. July 5th is the meeting we just discussed with the Colonel. And that's 6 7.30. And then now we have a four-way test. Every time he shows up late, I love to make him do the four-way test. Mr. Wallace, who didn't answer my phone call the other day, can't do it. No, no, that's a good reason. That's a good reason. With that said, Mr. Wallace, four-way test. Put it up or now? It doesn't matter. I mean, you got a card in your wallet. I do. Uh, so uh, the four-way test is a technical uh, test developed by Rotarians uh, that is supposed to be uh, four, four rules, four tests of everything we think, say, and do. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, and and that is, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Uh, so I can think of a lot of different scenarios where something may be the truth, but, but it may not be beneficial to all. Something may be fair, but it may not build goodwill and better friendships. So I think of this as four wings out.
if it passes all four of these, then you know that you're pretty much in the clear and you're acting in a uh, And that is today's forward pass. Thank you, Mr. Wallet. We all appreciate it. And with that said, we're all writing our like, closing remarks. Um, uh, the best way I can put it is this, it's, it's been describing me. And unfortunately, only Isabel's left on here. Pay your damn dues. That's what I can say about that. I am no better. I'm just saying, pay your damn dues. Eventually, we'll do it online. It'll work even better. But with that said, Mr. Raymond Foss with like two minutes. So uh, this is my last meeting as president of the Rotary Club for you guys. That's kind of exciting for me and get a little bit of time off. Uh, but, you know, I was out uh, on Monday, and I met with the men at the Masonic Lodge. And what we're looking to do is, I don't know, it, I've, we've talked about this briefly, but the chief of staff of the base, the, the colonel out there, told me his biggest problem is 5,000 teenagers on base, 1,500 dependent teenagers and 3,500 Marines that are either in holding companies or in schools that are under the age of 20, 17 to 20 years old. They have nothing to do. So we actually have begun to do a off-base game nights, which will start with board games, but we're working towards esports. And I have cemented the location. And immediately after I did that, today I got a phone call, and we've already raised two thousand dollars. So we've got the money to support the project, and we've got the location, and we hope to go forward about the same time as the food drive in September. We'll be doing our first game night, which we will host out uh, in Twenty Nine Palms for dependent Marine or children and the Marines who are teenagers. So it's pretty exciting stuff. So Rave has been all over this, which is wonderful because we're looking at transportation being taken care of as we students, something like the YMCA over there. We're super excited, we've got a bus, so on and so forth. Um, as you said, multiple locations now out there are excited about it. So I want to say this again, pay your damn dues. And I'm excited that Raymond's got this all lined up for that. Uh, with that said, if anyone else has anything, to reiterate what Mike said, if no one had heard it, simply this. September is quick. It's coming up fast. September 30th, we'll be here before you know it. Let's get down. Um, let's lock down flyers and everything else that we'd like to get passed out and be able to get it out to the public to be able to help the folks over at 2 9. That said, I think that's everything. Pleasure having you folks tonight. And I look forward to talking to you guys soon. Cheers. Yeah.